Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. My name is Cordant and in this video I'm just bringing you a more in-depth explanation on the character that I've chosen to make my new playthrough for the Triple Crown achievement in Pillars of Eternity. So this video is going to be released at the same time as the first episode for the playthrough. Uh, but since this can be a little bit lengthy and talking a whole lot about specifics of classes and races and attributes, I think it's better to be in a separate video for anyone wanting to get a better understanding of how the Pillars of Eternity system works. You can get that information here. In this case, I'm going to be mostly focusing on my own character, who's going to be, who is going to be a rogue, in this case a ranged rogue. So I could say that this uh, explanation video, whatever you want to call it, is going to apply to anybody wanting to play mostly from the back line, uh, hitting hard, hitting accurately, while also being somewhat squishy. So you don't actually want to get hit. Okay, so in any case, uh, you can pick male or female, doesn't really matter, they don't make, uh, there's not a difference in any kind of buff or penalty by picking one gender or the other. So just pick whatever you like. In terms of races, like I said, since I'm making my rogue, I'm going for the Orlan race. They have a bonus to resolve, which doesn't matter for what we're going for here. They have a penalty to might, which is actually somewhat undesirable for what we want to do, but they also have a plus two bonus to perception, which is very important. And I will go into more detail on what each of these attributes do when we actually reach the attribute section. But just to simplify what I'm saying here, you can think of resolve as your defenses, might as your strength or your damage, and perception is pretty much your accuracy. How often you're gonna hit your enemies and how often you're gonna be able to crit your enemies. So the considerations for the rogue, in my opinion, I think you have a good bet with the Omawa because they have extra might, two bonus, which is a lot. And they also have something pretty cool in the island Omawa as they have this passive armed to the teeth. And this just says that all island Omawa gain an additional weapon set. So this might not seem very important and this video is also relevant for people like me. When I started playing this game, my background was mostly Dungeons and Dragons based uh, RPGs in which the, the rule set, the, the gameplay elements are quite different to Pillars of Eternity. So this obviously doesn't follow a Dungeons and Dragons rule set. It has its own system designed specifically for Pillars of Eternity. So uh, if you're someone used to playing, for example, Baldur's Gate, this doesn't seem interesting at all, because in Baldur's Gate you can just swap your weapons in and out during combat, doesn't really make a difference. And by the way, weapon sets, in case you're not familiar with what that is, it just means you can have more than one combination of weapons equipped in your characters, and you can swap between them during combat. So when I first saw this, I thought, eh, this isn't interesting at all. I don't want this. This sucks. <laughs> but one thing cool about this is that in this game, you have some very powerful weapons. In this case, mostly gunpowder weapons like a rifle, an arquebus or, or pistols. And these are weapons, especially the, the rifle, that deal a lot of damage. They have high damage, um, high armor penetration, I should say. But the downside is that you need to reload them and it takes a very long time to reload a rifle. And don't think about rifles in Pillars of Eternity like a, an AK-47 or an AR-15, okay? That's not the case. You have a rifle with one shot, you shoot it, you have to reload, okay? Every time. So what's cool about having an additional weapon set is you can start a fight by opening up on your enemies with a nice shot from a rifle for very high damage 
And instead of having to wait for the reload to shoot your second shot, what you can do is shoot once, swap to your second weapon set, which can be another rifle, for example, shoot them again, swap to your third one, could again be a rifle, shoot them again, and then swap to your more consistent damage weapon setup. And this is actually pretty cool, especially for a rogue. And the reason for that, I will go into more detail when we go into the class, but rogues get sneak attacks in the first two seconds of combat. So if you can fire a couple of shots in those initial two seconds, you are guaranteed very, very high damage with the bonus for the sneak attack damage. So Island of Moa, having an extra weapon set, as well as having the might buff, is a pretty solid choice. What else do we have here? Um, dwarf, not really as interesting. Elf, the elf could also be an excellent choice. And this, again, I'm talking about making a ranged rogue. You could also consider what I'm saying here for a ranger, or for a wizard, or for an offensive cleric that's sitting in the back line. Wood elves have the passive distant advantage. Against any enemy that is more than 4 meters away, wood elves gain bonuses to accuracy, deflection and reflex. So, what this means is you have better defenses when you are fighting away from other people, so you are better defended against spells or archers. Um, and the accuracy, I think, is where we really need to talk a little bit about, because this is very different from other RPGs. So, again, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna keep using the example of Baldur's Gate because I believe it's the more commonly known RPG. Um, and in that game, if you shoot someone with a spell, especially, let's say, a fireball, it's gonna land, it's always gonna hit. Because you, you can even target an area. Anyone standing in the area is going to get hit. At most, they can save. Uh, you have some saving throws and you can save to take half damage. But you are always going to get hit. The one exception is rogues, I believe, from the 3rd edition forward. They can completely evade the damage. But it, it would still count as a hit. You don't need to do an attack roll in order to determine if you're gonna hit your opponents or not. In Pillars of Eternity, spells have accuracy. Even if they are not targeted at someone, even a fireball, it needs to hit. And if your accuracy is low, your spells aren't gonna do much. And obviously this also counts for anybody shooting a rifle, shooting a bow, whatever, but in that case it's kind of obvious. I'm just focusing on the non-obvious parts here, which is the spells. Um, other than stuff like fireballs, for example, you also have debuffs. Debuffs also need to hit. So if you had, let's say, a spell that can slow enemies in an area, the determining factor to see if it's gonna land or not, it's gonna be your accuracy score. So you cannot just ignore the accuracy um, what do they call this? It's not an attribute, a stat, I guess. You can't just ignore accuracy if you're playing with a spellcaster. It's also very important for them. Okay, so again, if you're playing with a ranged rogue, or an archer, anything like that, in my case, a rogue, I want to be playing in the back line. I'm going to be playing a squishy character. I don't want it to get hit, because if he does get hit, he's probably going to die. <laughs> so the farther away I am, the more comfortable I am, and by being far away, it's going to buff my accuracy, which is one of my more important stats. So also a very, very good choice. Finally, for my choice here, I'm going to go with Orlan. And this is the one I'm going to pick. And the reason for it is this passive right here. So we have Minor Threat. And this means that when attacking any target that is also being targeted by a teammate, Earth Orlans convert some of their hits into crits. So this is a pretty big boost to our potential damage. And the idea behind my ranged rogue is hit as accurately as possible with as many critical strikes as possible and this naturally is a way to achieve that. Coupled with the plus two bonus to perception 
this means an even higher chance to hit someone with a critical strike, so it's a pretty good buff. Okay, so this is my choice here, Orlan, Earth Orlan, that is my reasoning. The class, naturally, we're gonna go for the rogue. Now, uh, just some explanation here on how rogues work. So, uh, in Dungeons & Dragons games, I'm gonna again use Baljus Gate as, as an example, you have certain ways where you can trigger your bonus damage by being a rogue, and that's typically called a sneak attack. In the second edition, you simply have backstabs, which only work for melee weapons. Uh, from the third edition onward, you're gonna have sneak attacks, which require a certain um, you know, requirement in order for them to proc. In Pillars of Eternity, the way this works is a sneak attack damage is applied uh, to both ranged and melee weapon attacks. This is why a ranged rogue is viable. When the target has any of the following afflictions. Blinded, flanked, hobbled, paralyzed, petrified, prone, stuck, stunned or weakened. So you don't need to be behind your opponent in order to get a sneak attack damage. You don't need to be close for a backstab. As long as they have one of these afflictions, you are going to sneak attack on every hit you land. Also, sneak attack applies to any target the rogue strikes with a weapon within the first two seconds of combat. This is, again is why I was mentioning that the Island of Moa with the Arm the Teeth trait is actually quite cool. Um, okay, so other than that, we also have some skills. In this case, we have stealth and mechanics. Stealth is usually what you're used to seeing. This just means you can hide out of combat and it determines how close you can get to your opponents before you are spotted. Okay, pretty simple. The higher the score, the, the further you can go without people noticing you. Mechanics, this is, we can just um, sum this up to, this is your skill to disarm traps and to open locks. Okay, that's pretty much it. Now, another important thing to mention about rogues. Every class is going to have um, a, a couple of baseline attributes. In this case, endurance, health, accuracy and deflection, coupled with the skills we just went through. So a ranger has something like this, um, a fighter, for example, has something like this. In the case of the fighter, let's use it as an example, we have average endurance, we have high health, and, we've, and we have very high deflection. Why? Because typically you're gonna have your fighter fighting in melee, he's gonna be getting hit, and he's also gonna be dishing out damage. So he needs to be somewhat tanky and have a large amount of hit points to play with. So this is why we have these scores right here. If we compare it to a rogue, we can see that our endurance is considered very low, our health low, our defenses low, and our accuracy very high. So what is, uh, what are these stats over here? Because there's endurance and there's health. They are both your hit points, but they work in a different way. So just to, to get this out of the way. Endurance represents a character's short-term survivability. Damage that is not absorbed by a character's damage reduction goes straight to their endurance and health. Potions and healing magic, such as from a paladin, priest or a druid, can restore endurance in combat. When a character's endurance reaches zero, he or she will be knocked out. Not killed, he's gonna be knocked out. A knocked out character can be brought back in combat through the use of a revivability. Otherwise, characters will regain all of their endurance at the end of combat, assuming they're on the winning side. If everybody gets knocked down, you die. <laughs> okay, simple. And this is different from your health. Health is considered um, your long-term hit points. So health is long-term damage, only regained through rest and certain talents. Damage that is not absorbed by a character's damage reduction goes straight to their health and endurance. When a character's health reaches zero, they will either be maimed or killed. 
depending on the game se settings. I think this just depends on the difficulty. Uh, in Path of the Damned, which is the difficulty I'm going to be playing on, if a character uh, reaches zero health, they die. At least I think that's the default setting. Uh, a maimed character who is reduced to zero health will always be killed regardless of settings. So if you're playing on a lower difficulty, if your character reaches zero health, they get maimed, and if they die again, they will, or if they go to zero again in their health, they will die. Unlike Endurance, a character's health does not get restored after combat, but characters have much larger health values than Endurance values. So, what does this mean? In terms of Endurance, you're going to have 36 points plus 12 per level, and your health is 4 times your Endurance. So, you have 4, four times as much health as you have Endurance. And you can look at this as the following. Endurance is like your per-encounter health pool and health is your permanent health pool. So, like I said before, if you get dropped during combat, you are just knocked out, but if your health reaches zero, you are killed. Okay? And again, the rogue has very low on both of these. Our accuracy is very important because it is part of almost every attack. It influences how likely the attack is to affect the target. Accuracy is defined primarily by a character's class and level, but is also influenced by perception, talents and other active effects such as spells or items. When an attack is made, the accuracy is compared to the appropriate defense on a target to determine how the attack roll will be modified. If accuracy is above the target's defense, it will be more likely to result in a hit or a crit, less likely to result in a graze or a miss. Any ability or talent that does not use a weapon as part of the attack gains a small accuracy bonus based on the level of the character. So, the more accuracy you have, the more likely you are to hit, that part is obvious, but also the more likely you are to crit. So, if you're used to other games, and again I'm gonna go back to the Dungeons & Dragons comparison, you are probably used to seeing a critical strike when you roll your attack roll on a, a 20 sided dice, if it's a 20, it's gonna be a critical strike, which means it always hits and it deals double damage. Um, in Pillars of Eternity, that's not the case. Okay, it depends on the accuracy you have and it depends on how your accuracy compares to your target's deflection. And also, a crit does not mean double damage. I think it's 50% more damage. Deflection, again, this is one of our low stats and our accuracy is very high. Deflection is a defense used to resist direct melee and ranged attacks against a character that are not area of effect. It is defined by the character's class, level and resolve, but may also be influenced by shields, certain weapons, talents and other effects from spells or items. So, this would be one of the, um, the attributes or the talents, stats, <laughs> that you would want to have, for example, on a fighter. If you're going to be tanking, their baseline stat is very high for deflection. On a rogue, not so much. And again, this is why, in my opinion, if you're playing on, a, on Path of the Damned, it is safer for you, especially if you're not as experienced with the game, to play a character such as this more in the backline, and specifically as a ranged character. Um, because, like we see here, if we get hit, we don't have a lot of hit points to withstand the punishment, and we are going to get hit often if we are in a position to get hit, that's the important difference here, because our defenses are also very low. Okay? So, with this in mind, let's move on to the next section. The rogue abilities. Rogue abilities emphasize offensive strikes with ranged and melee weapons. Many cause afflictions that qualify for the rogue's sneak attack. Others strengthen the rogue's sneak attack or grant tactical positioning abilities. Again, the idea for a character such as this, or at least in my mind and my way of playing it, is it's going to be a nimble, mobile character 
who is going to be sneaky. He's not going to be in the front line. He's going to attack when it's advantageous to him. So he's pretty much going to pick his moments to join the fight. Uh, and we also have some positioning abilities, which are good. The other important thing to notice here is that we have skills that emphasize um, placing some afflictions on our opponents in order to trigger a sneak attack. So afflictions, I'm not going to go through all of this, but an affliction is pretty much a debuff. Okay, and I'm going to show you guys an example here. So we have at the start to choose one of these, and we have, for example, Crippling Strike. The rogue attacks his or her enemy's ability to move around effectively, inflicting extra damage to and hobbling any enemy successfully hit. Like we saw before, in our class choice, we can see that an opponent which is hobbled is going to be primed for sneak attacks. What's important here? We have two of these abilities per encounter, which means that every fight you can, you can use two crippling strikes. And for your next fight, you're going to have two of them again. You don't need to rest to recover those. The speed is just means how fast you can actually activate this ability. In this case, it's average. And then you also have another mechanic, which is new and unique to Pillars of Eternity, which is Interrupt. So Interrupt determines how likely a damaging attack is to delay their opponent's current or next action. The role uses an Interrupt value for, from the attacker, derived from Perception, that is then compared to the target's Concentration, derived from Resolve. A 1 to 100 roll is made, adding the Interrupt. If the result is higher than the Concentration, the target plays a hit reaction and their current action is delayed. The duration of the delay is determined by the interrupt strength listed on the weapon or attack. An interrupt applied to a character already suffering from an interrupt with a longer duration will have no effect. Okay, so things to note here. Um, if you're used to thinking in terms of Baldur's Gate, <laughs> if you are fighting an enemy caster, for example, a priest or a, a, a wizard or a sorcerer, and they are casting a spell, especially a somewhat long duration spell, what you usually want to do is shoot them in the face so they get interrupted and they lose their spell. In Pillars of Eternity, the interrupts not only apply to spell casters, but it, they actually apply to every single class for every kind of attack or cast. So I used the example before of shooting a rifle. Rifles are slow weapons, or actually very slow weapons. So if somebody is aiming at you and trying to shoot you, if you shoot them back, if your, if your weapon or ability have an interrupt score, you are going to delay your opponent's attack. Their rifle shot is going to take longer to actually go through. And it's also going to delay the spell casting of a spellcaster. Okay, so this is actually a pretty cool um, thing to have. Now, uh, as I said, Crippling Strike is going to put your target in a hobbled affliction, which means they have their dexterity reduced, movement reduced, and reflex save reduced. And more importantly, it's going to be able to the rogue is going to be able to proc sneak attacks while the target is hobbled. We also have blinding strike, which is pretty much the same thing in terms of what I just explained. The speed, the uses per encounter, the interrupt. In this case, this causes blindness, which means the, the target's accuracy is reduced by 25 for all sources. Perception reduced by 4, movement reduced, reflex and deflection also reduced. Okay. So, what is important here between these two? Mostly, you have a more potent effect with the blind at the cost of having one less per encounter. So, if your goal is to be able to um, make your opponents primed for sneak attacks by yourself, then having as many uses of abilities that proc such a thing as possible is good. 
So Crippling Strike would usually be an advantage to Blinding Strike. You can have 20 seconds of someone primed for sneak attacks instead of just 10 seconds. The other thing we have to talk about here is this full attack mentioned here. So what is a full attack? Many abilities will state that they, e that they use either a full or primary attack. When such abilities are used, the character applies the effect th through an attack with either all currently equipped weapons, full attack, or with their primary equipped weapon, primary attack. This means that all of the statistics of the weapon still apply, including the damage and other effects that they provide. So, if you are using a two-handed weapon, if your skill is a primary attack or a full attack, it doesn't make a difference. If you are using, let's imagine, dual daggers, what this means is, if you try to hit somebody with a crippling strike, you are immediately going to strike twice. And you actually have two chances to apply the effect, because both of your attacks are going to count as applying a crippling strike. If you only have a single weapon, you only have one shot. So this can be very cool for uh, dual wielding builds, for dual pistols, uh, dual daggers, dual swords, you know, whatever. Okay, I think this about covers what we have to say about these abilities. Next up, very important, we have the attributes. So in terms of the attributes, the game itself is gonna suggest what are the recommended attributes for your class. In this case, he is referring might as very important, perception as very important, and then you have dexterity and intellect as somewhat important. And the game is actually pretty right about this. <laughs> so, at first glance, you might look at this and say, what the hell is this here? Why do I need intellect for my rogue? It doesn't make sense. At least when I got the game, I'm used to thinking about intellect as a purely... Um, useful attribute for spellcasters. So for a cleric, for a wizard, for a sorcerer, for a druid, something like that. Not for a rogue, not for a barbarian, right? But in pillars, this actually changes quite a bit. And we're gonna go into that very soon. So I'll go, uh, I'll go about them one by one so you can understand this. So to start, might. Might represents a character's physical and spiritual strength brute force as well as their ability to channel powerful magic. During interactions it can be useful for intimidating displays and acts of brute force. So those are dialogue options. In combat it contributes to both damage and healing as well as the fortitude defense. Okay, so let's break this down. The fortitude defense simply means you are better defended against attacks which are... Um, um, What's the word I'm looking for here? Not prowling. That are praying. <laughs> that are praying on your fortitude score. The higher you have it, the more likely you are going to resist those attacks. Okay? Pretty simple. The other thing that might not be very obvious from the name is that might not only increases your damage, but also your healing. So if you're playing a character and you are planning to use him as a a very healing intensive character, Might is a stat that you really want to max. In case of my Rogue, as I want to have um, as powerful a shot as possible, I'm also going to be buffing my Might to the max possible amount. Now, something that's also worth mentioning, because it's not your typical um, functionality, for example, in Baldur's Gate, this one, uh, increasing it to 17, doesn't mean you're going to get an uh, extra chance to hit or um, a static amount of bonus damage. All of your attributes in Pillars of Eternity work in percentages. What does this mean? This means that um, you should think of your stats, of your attributes, as something more to complement your baseline stats other than trying to make your baseline stats something that they are not. Further explaining this. A rogue has very low constitution and resolve. 
So even if I got over here and I went like, I want to be a tank. I'm going to buff my constitution as high as possible. This is the maximum score, so I'm going to have a lot of hit points, right? No. It's percentage based. Since the rogue's baseline endurance is very low, increasing it by 40% doesn't really do much. Okay? And likewise, if you drop it to a very low score, sure, you are going to be more squishy, but it's not by that much. If you were doing this on someone like um, a tanking class, which has a lot of constitution, then dropping it to 3 makes no sense. Buffing it up makes a lot more sense. Same thing, now that we're talking about these percentages, in terms of might, if you are playing a character that wants to hit for damage, be it uh, with melee strikes, or I should say, be it with physical damage or magical damage, you want to buff your might. If you're playing someone who is mostly going to be a, a disabler or a debuffer or a buffer, might is pretty much irrelevant. So, for example, I made a playthrough where I wanted to have a character that was a wizard and what I wanted out of him was to disable my opponents as much as possible and, at the same time, buff my own characters as much as possible. And for that, I have no need for might. The only thing I need to do is hit my debuffs, make sure they are applied. So, your debuffs aren't increased with might, so this doesn't make a difference. Okay, so again, let me put this back where it was. Uh, like I said, constitution. We don't have a lot of constitution as a baseline stat, and we are not meant to be getting hit. So, in my case, that is why I'm dropping my constitution as low as 3. I'm not sure if I read this. So, constitution is a combination of the character's overhaul, health and stamina. Although it is not used much in interactions, it is sometimes checked to withstand pain or endure a physically taxing ordeal. So, I think there's a couple of interactions during the game where your constitution score kind of plays out, but it, it's, it's mostly irrelevant. In combat, it affects maximum health and endurance and contributes to the fortitude to defense. Okay. So then, we're gonna go for Dexterity. Dexterity is an abstraction of a character's hand-eye coordination, balance and overall grace. In interactions, it can be used for sleight of hand and fast reactions. In combat, it affects a character's action speed with all attacks, spells and abilities and, contribute, and contributes to the reflex save. So, Looking at what's right here, it's going to give you extra action speed and extra reflex saves. So the reflex saves work in the same way as a fortitude save, except they are targeting a different kind of defense. So straightforward. Action speed, this means you are going to attack faster. You're going to cast your spells faster. So also something that's not particularly obvious, like I said before, uh, spell casting in Pillars of Eternity doesn't really work in the same way as in Baldur's Gate or other games that, that use uh, turn and round based mechanics. So in Baldur's Gate you can cast one spell per round and that's pretty much it, excluding improved alacrity. Um, over here that's not the case. This means you're gonna be able to get your spells off faster and you can also recuperate from other situations faster. So I'm going to want to shoot as quickly as possible with my rogue. So it makes sense to me that I'm going to max my dexterity. Perception. Perception represents a character's senses as well as their instinctive ability to pick up on details. In interactions, it can be used to catch someone in a lie, to make an observant comment about their appearance, or to notice something happening in the background. In combat, it contributes to accuracy, the reflex defense, and grants a bonus to interrupt. Okay, so we went through accuracy and interrupts before, so I'm not going to repeat them. And again, this is, like it says over here, highly recommended for a rogue. The more accuracy you have, the more likely you're going to hit your opponents, and also the more likely you are to actually critical strike them. So... I want, um, I want my hits to be as powerful as possible, max might. I want them to be as accurate as possible, so 
so I max perception, okay? Pretty simple. Uh, like I said before, perception also very important for spellcasters. Don't think of this as only something for an archer or uh, a fighter. Everything you do has accuracy applied to it, okay? So keep that in mind. Intellect. This one is the least intuitive one, or I should say the least familiar one. Because intellect, at least for me, I'm used to thinking of, of this as a attribute uh, reserved for people who are spellcasters. So clerics, wizards, sorcerers, druids, anything that revolves around using your, um, you know, your intellectual power, your magic, your mana abilities, it makes sense to use intellect. If I'm playing any other RPG and I'm thinking of making, let's say, a very good example for this comparison here. If I'm thinking about a barbarian, I'm gonna make a barbarian with as much might as I can, with as much constitution as I can, probably dexterity, perception, to hit accurately and fast, but I don't really care about his intellect. He can be a dumb oaf, what do I care? He doesn't even need to know, to know how to read or write or speak. He just needs to smash, <laughs> okay? In Pillars of Eternity, it doesn't work that way. In this game, intellect is pretty much useful for every single class. What this does is, it's going to increase the area of effect and duration of your spells and abilities. So, going for this. Intellect represents a character's logic and reasoning abilities. In interactions, it can be useful for deduction, sudden realizations and problem solving. In combat, it contributes to the will defense, so same as reflex and fortitude, and influences durations and areas of effect for all abilities and talents. So, in the example I just gave of the Barbarian, which you can think about a, a big burly fighter with very low intellect, in this game, for a Barbarian, intellect is actually the most important ability because they have um, a skill which is called Carnage, which is a passive ability, uh, which means that every time they hit someone, it's going to damage everybody in an AoE. So the higher your intellect, the more enemies you're going to hit. If you dump your intellect, you're pretty much gimping your Carnage ability to the point where it's kind of irrelevant. In case of my rogue, it actually depends. If you're only focused by, about uh, very high single target damage and you want to leave the, um, the debuffs and enablers for sneak attack for your party companions, because naturally you can have your companions blind your opponents, flank your opponents, you don't actually need to be the one doing everything your companions can do it for you, you can actually just drop intellect and just focus on your other attributes because you only want to shoot or, or stab as hard as possible. You don't really care about the duration of your abilities. In my case, I actually like having... Um, I actually like being able to, to prime someone for sneak attacks by myself, not needing to always rely on my other characters. And not only that, if you blind someone with a rogue, it's gonna be useful for the rest of your party because this means your tank's not gonna get hit as much. Or if an archer is focusing your wizard, you can blind that archer and make him miss a lot more often. So it's also utility, not just a sneak attack enabler. So for that reason, this is where my remaining points are going to go into. Finally, we have Resolve. Resolve reflects a character's internal drive, determination, fearlessness, and the emotional intensity they can project to others. It can be useful for mental intimidation, leadership, and convincing performances. In combat, it helps characters maintain concentration and contributes to the will and deflection defenses. So, summing this all up, this is your armor class in other games. It's how often you're gonna get hit. Um, not only that, it can turn what would be a hit into a graze, which is a hit that deals less damage, or it can also turn a critical strike 
into a normal hit. The less deflection you have, the more likely you're going to get hit and the more likely you're going to get crit. So, for my character, deflection and constitution, as I talked about before, are my least, uh, are my lesser priorities. Because I want to be playing in the back line, I want to be playing from range, I want to be starting my fights in stealth and uh, choosing and picking my moments to join the fight. So the logic here is I shouldn't be getting hit in the first place. If I'm getting hit, I'm doing something wrong and I need to readjust. I shouldn't compensate my uh, poor play or less effective play by trying to buff my already very weak stats with some more resolve and more constitution. So for my choice, this is my final build for my character and this can be applied to other characters which play in a similar fashion. So hit hard, hit accurately, hit fast and make your effects uh, have a higher AoE or a longer duration. Um, what else is worth mentioning here? There was something I, want to I wanted to mention. <laughs> Let me think. Ah, yes, yes, okay. So this is what you could call a, a somewhat min-maxed build, right? I'm trying to maximize the things that I prioritize the most and I'm dumping my other stats. If you're just playing this game in a, in a lower difficulty or even in path uh, even on Path of the Dam, the highest one, you don't need to min-max as much as this, okay? You can perfectly well play with something like you want to be accurate, you want to be fast, you want to hit hard, but you also want to have some defenses. For example, this would also be a good build. Uh, the way that the developers made Pillars of Eternity and the reason why they're going mostly for percentage-based um, increases and decreases is to make sure that uh, your characters are never going to be completely useless. Because since this is basing itself on your base stats, you know, if your base stats are good, even if you dump a particular attribute, they're still not going to be crap. You can still, you can still play, okay? While if you are playing, for example, Baldur's Gate once again, and you decide to have a fighter and you dump his strength to six, you're going to have a, a very, very bad time, right? It's going to be useless. It's going to be a useless character. In here, it's not going to be useless. It's not going to be as powerful as it could be, but it's not going to be useless. And for my playthrough, I'm even going to be playing with story companions, which are not min-maxed at all. So you'll also have a chance to see how they play out and see that min-maxing isn't as important as some people might think it is. Okay, so if you want to play the game, you're not sure where you can really maximize everything, don't worry. Just go into the game, you're going to have a fun time, put some points in the things you think are, are useful. Maybe with what I just explained here, you're going to have a few more guidelines. So just, just have fun with it. So I'm just going to put this back to where it was. And we're going to continue. So we're almost done. In terms of culture, this doesn't really change much. Uh, it's going to change the equipment you start with. So this one you start with a particular set of armor and some weapons. This one is different. You know, each one has its own build. But the most relevant thing here, honestly, is going to be the attribute boost. In my case, since um, Orleans have a, a might penalty, I'm just kind of rounding it out here to 18 by having the Living Lands culture that gives me one extra mind point. Okay, not very special here. Not much to say. In terms of background, this will change a few dialogue options, how some characters perceive you, but... Overall, it's very irrelevant, doesn't make much of a difference, especially in terms of um, gameplay, your combat prowess, your effectiveness, it doesn't make any difference. The one thing that changes is the skill points you're going to get as a bonus. And each of these have a different subset. So 
In my case, I like Drifter because I get extra stealth and extra mechanics, as we saw previously, allowing me to be sneakier and allowing me to better disable traps and also better open locks. Again, not very complicated this part. And this means we are pretty much done. The only thing you have to do next is choose your appearance, choose your voice. I recommend well. Sinister for, <laughs> for a sneaky character. Um, but this pretty much finishes up my build. So like I said, this is the character that I will be playing throughout my entire playthrough of Pillars of Eternity 1. And once I finish that, it's going to be the character that I'll, that I'll import into Pillars of Eternity 2. Hopefully, um, this helps someone better understand some of the things that Pillars of Eternity has. Because like I said, it's not obvious. The system is complex. The more you look into it, the more nuance you're going to you're gonna see. And w giving myself as an example, when I first played this game, I didn't really have much of a fun time. Because all of my muscle memory, all of my habit is based in other games, more specifically Dungeons and Dragons, where the rule set is completely different. And the gameplay doesn't really apply in the same way here. Okay, there's, there's a lot of differences. And if, you, if you're not used to what you're doing, or if you're not used to the system, you're going to feel a little bit lost. So hopefully this guide helps you guys out, better understanding attributes, classes, races, the bonuses you get, the way that some of these attributes work for classes you would never really uh, attribute, it, attribute them to, such as, for example, intellect for a barbarian or perception for uh, a spellcaster or might for a healer. Um, in any case, if you guys have any questions, uh, anything at all you want to ask about Pillars of Eternity, any character build, anything you like, leave a comment below. I will make my best effort to answer you guys in a, uh, a way that will help you with your question. Um, and yeah, it's pretty much it. So if you want to get notified about other videos coming to the channel, notably the episodes for this particular playthrough, Feel free to subscribe, it's a free and easy way to support my channel and I'm bringing out videos every single day and I hope to see you guys in another episode. Until then, stay safe everyone.